People are going to die in these notes. Lots of people are going to die, die. Well, this is one of those uh, one of those notes where the uh, music actually matches up. Those are the little the literal words of those songs. People are going to die. That's not true. So, welcome back. We're going to start a new chapter today. Boy. All right. It is the age of religious wars. This is chapter four. As you can see from the scene uh, behind the title of the notes, it's going to be quite an interesting chapter, if I do say so myself. All right? So, let's start off this with an introduction to the chapter, and this is going to be what we're going to talk about in this chapter. Are you ready? I know I am. Breathe if you're excited. Joy. All right, so, uh, this chapter, Europe is going to start off heavily divided religiously. Okay, so, uh, Catholics are there, Lutherans are there, Calvinists, Anabaptists, all over Europe. Uh, but in reality, Catholics are still the main big religion. But uh, depending on where you are, uh, Protestant groups are growing. So we're starting off the chapter division. All right. Now, if you remember in the last chapter, there was this thing called the Peace of Augsburg. All right. And the Peace of Augsburg, if you remember, legalized Lutherans. So if you were a Lutheran, you were allowed to practice and worship and do all kinds of, you know, have any kind of freedom that you wanted to. Uh, but if you were a Calvinist or you were worse, an Anabaptist, you were not recognized as a legitimate religion by Catholics or Lutherans. All right. So divided, right? Lots of different groups, but division. Now, religious wars are what this chapter is going to be about. And we're going to talk uh, about a lot of, uh, of religious conflicts right at the very beginning of these notes. We're going to jump right into it. But you're going to see throughout these, uh, this chapter, there's going to be death. Like stabbing, killing, murdering. All right, all based on how people interpret the Bible. Uh, really, it's kind of sad and funny at the same time. But remember, there's always more going on. It's not just about... Um, it's not just about religion, it's also about politics, and it's also about, you know, uh, other things, other motives, right? So, one of the things that's going to happen in this chapter is the Thirty Years' War is going to happen. It's called the Thirty Years' War because it lasts about 17 years. That's a lie. That's a joke. It's a, all right? It's called the Thirty Years' War because it almost really lasts 30 years, e exactly, evenly. All right. So the Thirty Years' War is going to happen. It's what some historians call the very first World War. You know, like World War One that happened in 1914. All right. This is like 300 years before, but it's going to be a big World War, and pretty much the same people are going to be fighting, minus the United States. Although the United States didn't show up to the very end of World War One anyway. Who cares? Okay, let's keep going. All right, now, religious wars are going to lead to an in increasing skepticism about religion. So the next chapter after this, you know, unit is going to be about the scientific revolution. All right, and the scientific revolution happens largely because of people are so fed up and they think killing each other over religion is so stupid, they're going to start to think more secularly. And if you guys remember from last chapter's key terms and people, secular means not religious. So people are going to focus more on, I mean, don't get me wrong, Europeans are still going to be religious for a very long time, but uh, they're going to have a bigger focus, at least in government and things like that, on secular ideas. Why? Because the religious war showed people how how stupid we can get about religion. And finally, it's like I said, going to help lead to the, the scientific revolution in a later chapter. All right. So these are all things uh, that you should be able to connect later on that lead, you know, from one thing leads to another cause and effect. But we won't worry about that until we start doing LEQs and DBQs. All right. And barbecues. BB. <laughs> BBQ. Guys, that's what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to get a BBQ. All right. And I'm going to have to use my primary sources. Nobody? Okay. All right. Okay. Well, uh, let's move on to our essential question 4.1. So here's what I want you to think about as we go through these notes. 
what were the political and religious causes of wars in Spain and France in the 16th century. So we're just talking about Spain and France today. Now, the religious wars are going to happen all over Europe, all right, even in England, but we're just talking about Spain and France today, okay? So, what, okay, oh yeah, pause if you need to, we're moving on. Okay, religious wars in France. So, now guys, this is some really Game of Thrones stuff, all right? Any, nobody watch, anybody watch Game of Thrones in here? Raise your hand. Let's talk about the status of France in the mid-16th century. So the mid-1500s, what is France like? Well, number one, there's Huguenots. Now, Huguenot is a very fancy word for a French Protestant. Actually, it's a French Calvinist, okay, because John Calvin was originally from France before he went to Geneva. So France is largely following, if you're Protestant, Calvinist ideas, all right? Uh, but... Um, not all of France is Calvinist, guys. Very, very, very small percentage of France. All right? Uh, now, I want you to know something. The monarchs of France during this time are called the Valois dynasty. All right? Valois? Valois? Val I can't believe I don't know how to say that. Guys, i got to look that up. You, you guys keep writing. All right? How do you say... I'm Googling this right now. All right? Keep, keep going, guys. I'll put another thing up there. All right? Thank uh, how do you say... Valor. All right, let's just check this out, guys. I'm just Val Valois. Valois. I was lying, guys. So the monarchs of France are called the Valois dynasty. Valois is their last name. All right. So anytime we talk about a Valois king, that's what we're talking about. All right. So 10% of the population is Huguenot. All right. Now 90% of the population is Catholic. So do you see how the majority of France is still very Catholic, right? Now, here's the weird, uh, here's the uh, dangerous thing here, right? 40% of all nobles identify as Huguenot, all right? So think about that. Why would a noble want to be a Protestant? I think we've answered this question before, because nobles still largely are trying to be autonomous from the king. They want to do their own thing. One way you can be autonomous is you can say, hey, I'm a Protestant. And then if the king's Catholic, you can be like, hey, you're Catholic. You're, I don't even have to do what you say. You're not even a real religion. And then, they, you know, they get mad and they fight. So think about that. 40% of all nobles of France are Protestant. And of course, the king is Catholic. All right. Now, like I was telling you, nobles and the king are going to struggle for a very long time for control. All right, and it's not really going to come to head and to a head and until a later chapter, but basically nobles want to do their own thing, and the kings of France always want nobles to do what they want. All right, so there's this struggle for power that we've been talking about ever since pretty much chapter one. All right, okay, now let's talk about the source of these conflicts, guys. Here's where it gets a little crazy. All right, so the monarch is going to try to push Huguenots to control nobility, punish. They're going to try to punish Huguenots to control the nobility, all right? They want to go around and control nobles, and there are just kind of flashes here and there of violence. For instance, there are examples of, uh, you know, a Catholic priest walking down the street in certain parts of uh, France, and then a Protestant would be like, hey, you sneaky little Catholic, and like stab him to death out of nowhere, all right? So, uh, crazy stuff. There are massacres that just break out in different parts of France. Why? Because Catholics and Protestants don't get along. Okay? But let's talk about how a major fight breaks out. So, while people every once in a while have murders in the streets, it all, kinds of, it all kind of builds up to this really big fight. All right? So, it's a crisis of the throne. So, Henry, Henry uh, II, Henry Valois II, is the king of France. And he's in a tournament, you know, like a jousting tournament, right? But something goes terribly wrong, guys. I'm pretty sure he takes a lance through the head, and he dies. So, Henry II, king of France, dies in a tournament, okay? And when he dies, there's a crisis, because the next guy in line is a little kid, Charles the Ninth. He's an 11 year old boy. Now guys, an 11 year old boy, uh, you know, doesn't really know how to king, how to, how, to, how to king, how to be a king. So what generally happens is if a monarch becomes king, uh, and they're not old enough to really rule, like 11 years old is not old enough, what has happened is usually somebody rules as what's called a regent. All right. A regent is kind of like ruling in your place until you're old enough. Well, who is his regent? Dear old Mumsy, all right? Dear old Mum for you English uh, students in my class that are from uh, Great Britain, all right? So her name is Catherine de' Medici, and she is the regent of 
uh, Charles IX, and she's also Charles IX's mom, okay? Now, Catherine de' Medici is very Catholic, as is Charles IX, and as are all the Valois, they are very, very Catholic, and they want to control France, and they want all of, Cath all of France to be Catholic, all right? Now, an 11-year-old king is kind of an influential or influenceable person, so what you are going to see in the background is this. There are three families kind of vying for the ear of the king. And by the ear of the king, I mean they want to be close to the king. And the family that ends up being very close to the king is the family called the Guise family, all right? G-U-I-S-E. You'll see them a little bit later, all right? So rival families are competing for control of the young king, even though mom's in control. But the family that gets really close to the king are called the Guise family. And the Guise family are very strong Catholics supported by this Spanish ruler in, 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 uh, in Spain. He's Catholic too. All right. So Catherine's Catholic. The, the family that is their advisors are Catholic. There's going to be a problem here in a second. Are you following me here? All right. Pause if you need to. We're moving on. So, so here's where it all goes down, guys. It all gets a little crazy. There's a wedding of Margaret Valois to Henry of Navarre. All right. Now you might be like, man, who the heck is Margaret Valois? Well, Margaret Valois is the king's sister, Charles the Ninth, and she is Catholic. Okay. So guys, you can see on the right uh, is Margaret, the king's sister. All right. So Henry of Navarre is a Protestant noble. What? The king's sister's a Catholic and she's getting married to a Huguenot, a Protestant? What? This is not a good idea. Oh man, it's very controversial. And to make things worse, guys, Henry of Navarre invites every wealthy noble Protestant he can to show up into Paris for the wedding. All right? So think about it. There's already all these fights and stabbings and murderings uh, from Protestants to Catholics, guys, in uh, Paris. And now here comes Henry showing up, rolling up with his homies, all right, in Paris. So it makes France a little uneasy that all of these Protestants, it makes Paris a little uneasy that all these Protestants are showing up, all right? Now, Catherine Medici, de Medici gets some kind of bad advice from her advisor, one of the Guise families, the head of the Guise family, kind of basically says, look, we've got all these Protestants in town, something bad might happen, let's wipe them out. So, Catherine de Medici orders the massacre of all Huguenots in Paris, and it breaks out, guys. So, this is called... Bartholomew's Day Massacre, and look, it's in red because it's massacre-y. It's a red, bad blood everywhere, 1572. Okay, so here's, for, here's this picture, guys, that I showed you in the background. This is a, uh, a painting of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. It might also end up on a test, hint, hint. Anyway, it's pretty bloody if you look at it. I mean, look, there's, you know, blood right here. There's, ooh, look, right here, there's like some intestines on the ground. Like somebody got their intestines spilled out and it looks like a woman. Oh my goodness, that's bad. So yeah, people are getting massacred in the streets. Now, who's doing the massacring? The Catholics. And 10,000 to 20,000 Protestants are murdered throughout Paris and France. I just said Paris, but and France. It starts in Paris, guys, but it spreads pretty soon to all over France. Now, guys, this is going to be the most gangster episode of Mr. Lahan's AP European History Notes for a while. And why is it gangster? Check this out. The Pope's name at this time, the Pope of the Catholic Church, is Gregory the Thirteenth. X is 10 plus 1, 2, 3, 13, right? And guys, he actually made a commemorative coin to commemorate or honor the day of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, guys. How gangster is that? You're going to make your own coin, and on the back of the coin, guys, you see Catholics massacring Huguenots, all right? You guys ever see those, like, infomercials of, hey, buy this commemorative plate, or buy this commemorative uh, whatever? Well, guys, here's a commemorative coin, uh, uh, you know, celebrating the massacre of Huguenots. That's gangster, guys. That's how you do it when you're Pope Gregory the Thirteenth. All right. So there's been a big massacre, guys, and this is going to start a big war. And it's actually a very confusing war, guys. So it started massive religious wars in France all over. But one of the most famous wars, guys, is also going to be one of the most confusing. It's called the War of the Three Henrys that we're going to talk about on the next slide. So pause if you need to. We're moving on. 
All right. Hey, welcome back. Hey, did you? Are you guys following what's going on right now? Why? Why there's massacres and slaughters and all this stuff? You are. Okay. I'm just gonna assume you're nodding your head. Yes. So let's talk about the War of the Three Henrys. Now. Back when I first started teaching this, guys, it was really confusing, and I didn't quite myself understand it, but luckily, it's been five years, and I get it, okay? So there's three Henrys fighting for control, all right? One of the Henrys is Henry III, Henry Valois, the next guy in line for the throne. So remember, Charles IX is the 11-year-old king. His sister, Margaret, just got married to Henry of Navarre, right? Well, Henry III, guys, is the next guy in line once Charles IX dies. He's a Valois. So, he is another son of Catherine de' Medici, and he's Catholic, uh, and he wants to, you know, just, he wants to rule, just like his brother does, all right, and he wants all of France to be Catholic, right? Okay, now, the other, the second Henry fighting for the throne is Henry of Navarre. He's the guy that got married to Margaret, the sister of the king, all right? So, Henry of Navarre is a Protestant, so he's a Huguenot, and here's the deal, guys, he has some support some military support from the English Queen Elizabeth I. Now, we'll talk about her a little bit later. Uh, not today, guys, but in another thing of notes, all right? But he's got the backing of an English queen. Why? Because England's Protestant, and so is Henry of Navarre. Now, the third Henry that's going to fight in this war, guys, is called Henry of Guise. Remember, I told you that the Guise family that was influencing Charles IX and gave them advice to start massacring Huguenots, right? So, now, Henry of Guise is a noble, and he's Catholic, and he's one of the king's advisors, all right, advisor to Charles IX. So, now, Henry of Guise is actually supported by King Philip II of Spain, all right? So, look at this. It's almost like kind of a European war. You've got England jumping in on this and Spain jumping in on this. Now, why would Spain jump on the, in on this? Catholic, and they want all of Europe to be Catholic, right? So now, here's what's epic, guys. The war is going to last, uh, you know, for several years, but it all ends up like this, guys. Henry III gets assassinated. Henry of Guise gets assassinated. The only Henry that does not get assassinated is Henry of Navarre. And he's like, oh yeah, gangsta. Let's do that again. Oh yeah, gangsta. So anyway, guys, Henry of Navarre is the only one that survives, and because he's the only one alive, when Charles IX finally dies, guys, guess who gets to be the king? You guessed it. Henry of Navarre. All right? So, pause if you need to. We're moving on. So, here you guys got have cool little uh, gangsta... What, no, what are these sunglasses called? They're not called gangsta. They're called um, thug life sunglasses. All right, that's what they're called, th thug life. All right, so Henry becomes king of France, and he actually is called Henry IV because the second died in a tournament. The third got assassinated on the last slide, so he's actually going to be Henry IV. Oh, man, confused yet? Well, you shouldn't be. Anyway, so Henry IV is Protestant, right? He's, I mean, the whole thing was he's fighting to protect Huguenots, but here's the deal. He knows that most of France is Catholic. So, guys, Henry IV is going to do something that is very, you know, peacemaking of him. In 1593, Henry converts to Catholicism to make peace. All right? Now, guys, wasn't that a very peacemaking move there? He's Protestant, but he knows most of France is Catholic. So he makes peace by saying, look, I'll be a Catholic king. Now, guys, there's a name for this in your key terms and people. It's called politique. Politique means you are being a politician. You are putting your own ideas and desires on in the background so that you can make peace. You are playing the game, right? Okay, so he issues this thing called the Edict of Nantes. Now you're going to need to remember the Edict of Nantes a little bit later on in another chapter. Okay, but he issues the Edict of Nantes. All right, I'm about to sneeze. Hold on. Maybe. Come on. And it didn't work. So, here's what the Edict of Nantes says. Remember, Edict is a law. Nantes is a place in France. The Edict of Nantes says Catholicism is the official religion of France. So, all the Catholics are like, yay, woo, we love you. But he says, but Huguenots living in certain areas of France have the free ability to worship however they want to. All right? 
So all the Huguenots are like, yay! Do you see how he made peace, guys? He said basically both Catholics and Huguenots uh, can exist, but on the other hand, Catholics are going to um, be the main religion, okay? So guys, Henry IV is actually making peace, and the Edict of Nantes is a very big deal because it's going to legalize Huguenots in France, okay? You got me here? What happens to Henry IV? Well, he creates peace in France, and then he gets assassinated in 1610. So, oh man, got capped. Peace out, Henry of Navarre. Pause if you need to.